Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us here today and learn about optimizing our recycling education and outreach efforts. My name is Erin Victor, and I'm an environmental analyst at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, where I lead our statewide recycling education campaign, Recycle Smart MA. And today I'm gonna to be sharing you, with you what we have learned here at MassDP from working with marketing professionals, diving into the behavior change science, and our own marketing research, as well as good old trial and error. Um, and actually, I will turn on my video for part of this. Uh, and before we dive in, I wanted to let everyone know that this is being recorded and we will share out the slides and a link to the recording um, within a couple weeks after this session. And there will be some time for questions at the end, which will be facilitated by my colleague Janice Ampare here at DP. Uh, and she's also, I'll just also point out that she's the one that manages our recycling IQ kit program and the mastermind behind the scenes of our Recyclopedia. So she's going to be a great person to ask questions for as well. Or two. Let's see if I can. Hello. Now you can see my face, hopefully. <clears throat> yes, we can see your face. Right. It's beautiful. <laughs> So does this look familiar? Whether it's letting people know about your upcoming household hazardous event, waste event, or what does and doesn't belong in the recycling bin, or a change in your operational hours at the recycling drop-off center, the bottom line is that you need to get people's attention. We're living in what they now have dubbed the attention economy, where companies across the world have figured out that our attention is our most valuable commodity. This means that organizations are spending millions of dollars trying to capture our attention. And I'm gonna make the assumption that you are in the same boat as we are here at MassDP and you don't have millions of dollars to spend on your recycling education and outreach efforts. So how do we break through the noise? Well, I have some good news. While we may be no match for Kim Kardashian, who is known for breaking the internet, the Recycle Smart campaign um, has learned a thing or two about getting people's attention, and even more importantly, using that intention in order to motivate behavior change. Since we launched the campaign in the fall of 2018, we've grown to a pretty sizable following of smart recyclers, in part thanks to our furry friend Rio here. So here's where we're going today. I'm gonna to start with a quick overview about what Recycle Smart is all about, and then I'm gonna jump into the tips and tricks that we've learned throughout this journey. My goal at the end is a power of this power hour is that you leave feeling empowered and that you have some new tools in your toolbox to take back and implement in your own community. At the end, um, Ali said, I mentioned, I'll open it up for questions, and I would also encourage you and welcome you to share your own experiences with recycling and education outreach efforts and what's worked and what hasn't. But first, let's get a better picture of who is joining us today. Uh, if Janice, if you could launch the first poll. Can you see it? Uh, I think it's gone. Okay. How is your trash and recycling collected in your community? Did you get it? I'm sorry. I can't tell. I'm really sorry. <laughs> From oh. my end, I saw it, but oh, okay. yeah, there I can see the results. Okay. So it looks like the majority of us have curbside with drop-off options, 47%. Um, there's a lot of curbside communities and there's a fair number of drop-off and transfer stations. So the great news is that we are gonna be talking today about techniques that are generalized enough to work for your program regardless of how it is set up. Just one second here. <clears throat> so Recycle Smart. <clears throat> here is the Smart Recycling Guide, our go-to reference for recycling regardless of where you live, work, or play in Massachusetts. For a material to be included here, it had to have an actual viable market, 
the recycling facilities had to have the equipment to sort this material or take it and bail it and bring it to market, and the material couldn't be a safety risk for workers. After going through pretty much every recyclable material you can think of, one by one, we landed on this guide. Metal food and beverage cans, plastic bottles, jars and jugs and tubs, glass bottles and jars, and paper and cardboard. The bottom line with only five pictures, you may have guessed, is not a comprehensive picture of nose. There are millions of products and listing them all would take a very long time. And it would be a very large guide that probably no one would wanna read. This design is intentional. These are the top five headaches for the folks at the recycling facility because they either shut down equipment, decrease the value of other recyclables or harm workers. For example, what we have here at the bottom right, tanglers. This is what those hoses, chains, and film plastic look like at the recycling facility. They tangle themselves around the sorting screen, hence the name Tangler, and everything shuts down. And that's when it's someone's job to climb into this equipment and cut those items loose. It's a dangerous job. It also means that recyclables are not being processed that entire time that is happening. So you may be wondering, what's the big deal? Just tell people that hoses aren't recyclable. Check, problem solved. The challenge, you say you have to acknowledge you have a problem before you can address it. According to our market research, most people don't know that they have a problem when it comes to recycling. They've been recycling for years. They know how to recycle and they believe that recycling is a static thing. Despite the fact that 77% of Massachusetts re residents felt that they know what belongs in their household recycling bin, eight out of 10 thought that plastic with any number on it can be recycled. Oof. We realized that we had our work cut out for us. So at this point, Janice, if you could launch our second poll. My question for you is what materials do you get the most questions about? Okay, plastic numbers, resin number, yes. People are very confused, as I just mentioned, about the plastic number one through seven. Fair number of questions about pizza boxes, takeout containers, and milk cartons. So that's, I made this list based just off of what we see a lot of, um, and I was just interested to hear if they're similar for you. So here is how we've been tackling this challenge. This is our secret sauce based on the last several years of working in the, with the marketing wizards, learning about behavior change and through a lot of trial and error. I've summarized these lessons into six overarching themes. Get to your point fast, show, don't tell, know your audience, remove the hurdles, ask for help, and iterate, iterate, iterate. So let's get to my first point. Eight seconds. This is the average tension span today. That means with any educational campaign about recycling behavior, we have to get to the point and fast. So here's our most important message with Recycle Smart: Do not bag your recyclables. When we asked the material recovery facilities if they could share just one message that would make the biggest difference in improving the quality of our recycling stream, what would it be? The answer was do not bag recyclables. You don't need to try to be overly creative, just make your point clearly and concisely. In Chip and Dan Heath's book, Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard, they say "Look, what looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity. So let's make it crystal clear what you're asking residents to do. Don't just tell them to recycle smart, tell them how. Go ahead, get emotional already. Studies have shown that people rely on emotions rather than information in order to make decision. Capture your resident's attention by sharing something surprising or that sparks joy, like this video of ferrets playing and packaging peanuts. This is one of the most shared posts on Recycle Smart's Facebook page, reminding folks that packaging peanuts don't belong in the recycling bin, but may be brought back to pack and ship stores um, for reuse. 
We've all probably heard the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. Well, that may work for selling newspapers, but researchers who have analyzed word of mouth communication found that people are more likely to share positive news, not negative news. In a similar to, it's similar to the concept of a social smile. If you smile at a baby, the, the baby will instinctively smile back at you. Use humor. As humans, we crave novelty. We like things that are out of the ordinary and are unexpected, like this sign that uses humor to remind dog owners to pick up after their pet. How much more likely are you to read this sign than say this one? How can you use humor to capture your residents' attention and get them to actually read your recycling signs and banners? You may be wondering, is there a place for negative messages? It ends up, yes, negative or loss frame messages work best to motivate people to action when you pair it with clear instructions, like this idea that garden hoses shouldn't be put into your recycling bin. On the other hand, if you are trying to motivate larger, more abstract, less immediate behaviors like recycling in general, that's where positive messages or game framed messages are best to use like this image we created for social media about recycling a ton of paper, saving 15 trees. Okay, tip number two, show, don't tell. As humans, we are extremely visual. As you can see in this infographic, 70% of all of your sensory receptors are in your eyes, which I think is pretty neat. We can process the things we see in pictures, videos, or even these infographics a lot faster if we only heard or read the exact same content. Which is why they say a picture is worth a million or a thousand words. This graphic summarizes the findings from a clinical trial published in the Journal of Patient Education and Counseling, where the researchers looked at whether or not incorporating pictograms on medicine labels influence patients' understanding and adherence. Ends up yes patients were both more likely to understand and adhere to the instructions on the medicine label when pictograms were included. Does this concept seem eerily familiar to you? It should, that's exactly what we did with the Smart Recycling Guide. You'll notice that, I apologize for the train in the background if that sound is bugging you. <laughs> I have no control over that part. Um, you'll notice that this guide pairs images and text. Why do images make such a difference? Well, if you could, I could give you an example. You may call it a soda can. I'm from Michigan, so that's a pop can. When we look at this picture, we both know we are talking about the same thing. Plus, a picture goes much further when you're trying to reach a diverse audience where English may not be someone's first language, whether or not the words are also translated. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, what about videos? Well, it ends up people have calculated this. A one minute video is said to be worth 1.8 million words. Our eyes are attracted to movement, so videos naturally draw in people's attention. They also are pretty good at keeping our attention. It ends up that marketers crunched the numbers and found out that people are over 27 times more likely to click on an online video ad than a static banner and an, that videos get 1,200% more shares than text and images combined. And the online video trend is showing no signs of stopping. It is estimated that the average person will spend 100 minutes every day watching online videos in 2021. So a good tip for those of us who don't have millions of dollars or the time to spend making our own videos, you can make videos like the one that we just showed you here by just taking static images and overlaying text on them and animating those with either Adobe or one of the many free online video maker apps available. You just Google online video making app. And we would be remiss not to mention the power of storytelling. Storytelling can really shape our behavior. They're how we understand and make sense of the world around us. They can help us understand different perspectives, explore alternative realities, and better retain information. By activating multiple parts of our brains and eliciting a psychological response, such as the release of chemicals cortisol, oxytocin, and dopamine, anyone hoping to motivate others to change their behavior should add storytelling to their education and outreach toolbox. Here at Recycle Smart, this is where our monthly newsletter comes into play. In May, we introduced recyclers to Mo, 
well, his real name's Ed, but Ed says no, just didn't have quite the same ring to it. Anyways, in the feature article, Mo told us about his day at the plant manager at one of our material recovery facilities here in Massachusetts. He walked us through his morning, which starts at 4.30 a.m., by the way, up until the last machine is shut off at 12.30 the next day. Don't worry, he's not there the whole time. They do have shifts. He helps give us a new perspective to recyclers about just how important it is about what items they put in the recycling bin. Imagine, remember the picture before of Tanglers? Imagine crawling into a large sorting screen to remove plastic bags as part of your job. Storytelling can be a powerful tool to drive behavior change. Okay, tip number three, know your audience. Even in very small communities, there is a wide range of preferences, perspectives, knowledge, and attitudes among residents, which influence to what extent a particular message is going to reach and resonate with them. In marketing, there's this concept called audience segmentation, or tailoring your message to reach smaller, more homogeneous subgroups of your target audience based on the criteria that they all share, such as the platforms that they use to get their news, demographics, similar interests, similar behavior, behavior, etc. One helpful way to think about knowing your audience is thinking about the ed your educational efforts through the lens of what our friends at the Recycling Partnership call the information hierarchy. If you want to or need your message to reach the most number of people, focus on one simple message, like for Recycle Smart, this is do not bag your recyclables. This is what goes on the billboards, the banners, the radio PSA. Some folks may want to get a little bit more. Great. Send them the smart recycling guide or in the mail or let them know what is and isn't recyclable. A small handful of people, which we lovingly call our alpha recyclers, which I will include myself in and I'm assuming most of you as well. Well, we want it all. If you are a recycling nut like me, the more information, the better. This is where a Recyclopedia online search tool comes into play. The Recyclopedia is a searchable database of hundreds of items that lets people know exactly what to do with those wine corks or pizza boxes. The problem is when we start educating residents, assuming that everyone else is like us, is when we start designing overwhelming and ineffective educational campaigns. Think about banners crammed with so much text that you need to wear reading glasses to see it, or websites with mile long lists of materials which bin they go in, why they go there, and the history of recycling dating back to the 1700s. Okay, so I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get my point. With Recycle Smart, we realize that we can't afford to reach only our fellow recycling enthusiasts. And I hope that when you think through your next recycling campaign, using information, the information hierarchy will help you also realize that it's time to stop preaching exclusively to the choir. Another great way to know your audience is to figure out where they look for recycling information. In a recent survey conducted by the Recycling Partnership, they found that most residents look for recycling information online. This echoes what we found in our own statewide recycling participation study from 2015. We saw that the internet is the go-to resource for recycling information with nearly half of participants indicating that they looked on their town website, state website, or internet search. But there's also a significant number of base aiders turning to town supplied information, such as a brochure or even directly calling the town for their pressing recycling questions. So that's where it's important to get the word out in as many ways as possible. For example, radio, movie theater ads, op eds, social media, billboards, banners, sandwich boards, interviews in local TV. Um, people look for recycling information in various places. So if you wanna reach the maximum number of people, you should use different mediums. Doing so not only ensures that your messages reach the most residents' eyeballs, it can also have the added impact of aligning what they call effective frequency in marketing. With our Recycling IQ Kit program, we encourage communities to focus on one message for a limited amount of time, such as do not bag recyclables, if you're seeing a theme here, they make sure that the message is everywhere residents may be, a pop-up banner in town hall, a billboard in town, directly mailing to each resident's house, on hanger tags on the recycling bins, or at the soccer field. The idea here is that a person needs to see that same message a number of times before they can really hear and respond to it. While the exact number of times is up for debate, the most popular is the rule of seven. In psychology, they call this the mere exposure effect. 
essentially that familiarity leads to preference for a thing, idea, or message. So don't worry too much about repeating yourself and feeling like you're nagging. Repetition creates familiarity, which creates preference for your message. Another way to know your audience, what motivates them? Again, our statewide recycling participation research, we wanted to know what was the best argument for being more careful about what you put in the recycling bin. In the end, municipal costs increasing and worker safety hazards were the winners. Don't have time or money to do your own market research study? Don't worry about it. You can start by taking talking to people in your community to better understand what they care about. Do a quick online poll on your social media account or simply just keep testing new messages and see what sticks. <clears throat> Tap into local pie, pride. This is Jocko. He's a six foot bi-spectacled parrot who is on display at the Mascot Hall of Fame. Yes, this is a real thing. It's located in Whitting, Indiana, just outside of Chicago, in case you ever wanna plan your next trip. Jocko is not just any parrot. He's a St. Lucian parrot. And he is part of the story of how this species that was seemingly doomed to extinction made an incredible comeback. The St. Lucian parrot's population increased 400% since the late 1700s and remains dead decades later. The secret ingredient, pride. At the time when he first visited the island, Paul Butler was a recent graduating graduate working on a shoestring budget that would have put most workers to um, put their hands like up in defeat. He was tasked with such a big mission to help revive the parrot's population. So how did he do it? He tapped into local pride. He helped St. Lucians realize that this parrot was theirs. It's something that no one else on earth has. They should take pride in it and protect it. The St. Lucian parrot is now the national bird of the island and an inspiration for pride campaigns taking a, a place across the world to help conserve endangered species. So how can you apply this? How can you tap into local pride? Here in Massachusetts, we regularly highlight our municipalities, our schools, our community groups, our universities, and our businesses that are embodying what it means to be a smart recycler. We are shifting away from this idea of just being people who recycle correctly, which is a behavior, to people who are smart recyclers, which is an identity. It's part of what makes us proud to be base daters. Tip four, remove the hurdles. We are quick to look at the people not recycling, recycling incorrectly or not following instructions and assume that they just don't care or that they're lazy. But is there any chance that we've unintentionally put up barriers to the behaviors that we are hoping for? How can we make it easy or at least a little easier? I love this quote from Chip and Dan Heath. If you want to change people to change, you can provide them clear direction, boost their motivation and determination. Alternatively, you can simple, simply make the journey easier, create a steep downhill slope and give them a push. Small tweaks to the physical environment are often all you need to change behavior. For example, if your goal is to decrease the single use of single use plastics in community, simply have local restaurants only provide straws upon request instead of as the default. And that most people won't even think to ask for a straw for drink a cup of water, but would use it if provided by a waiter or a waitress. Oh, or I bet you know which container here is for recycling and which one's for trash. Even without seeing the labels, simply changing the color of the container and the shape of the opening on the lid can increase both the quantity and the quality of recycling. We've talked about this a few times here, but one major hurdle to recycling is messages that are hard to find, unclear or inconsistent. The best way to know if your recycling information is clear and accessible, ask an outsider, someone who doesn't know all the recycling industry jargon or is visiting your recycling center for the first time or just moved to town is trying to navigate your website to find out what's recyclable. It can be incredibly insightful. I bet many of here, us here are guilty of using one or more of these terms, commingled recycling, single stream recycling, zero sort recycling, when talking to the public. These are the results again from our statewide recycling participation research. You will notice that a lot of this medium blue on the left indicating people are not sure what these terms mean, 
More alarming, the green bars indicate a pretty large number of people who felt these terms meant mixing trash and recyclables together, which begs the question, when we use vocab like single stream recycling, are we unintentionally encouraging contamination? This is a good example of how industry jargon creeps into our websites, social posts, and even signage at the transfer station and can get us into trouble. At Recycle Smart, we're always thinking through this when we design messages. We are sure to say things like recycling facility rather than MRF and avoid things like single stream in our messages. We also often use someone less close to the recycling world, yes, sometimes that's a significant other or family member, to help vet our messages beforehand. Provide direct feedback. Remember how we found that people think they are better recyclers than they are? Whenever possible, providing direct feedback is a great way to reach people who think they know how to recycle but actually don't. A precursor to the Recycle Smart program here at Massachusetts, we had and still have our Recycling IQ Kit program, which is a toolkit for municipalities to provide direct feedback to residents on their recycling behaviors. Um, in curbside communities, this includes tagging contaminated bins with a note about what items shouldn't go in the bin. The bins are not picked up until residents remove the plastic bag, hose, or in some cases, a wheelchair. Yes, we have seen a wheelchair crammed in a recycling cart. At the Recycling Drop-Off Center, direct feedback comes in the form of having volunteers or staff directly interact with recyclers, recyclers while they are sorting their materials. This idea of direct feedback can even be accomplished online. For example, we recently launched the Smart Recycling Quiz, the Recycle Smart Quiz, where people can get immediate feedback. Um, we launched this at the end of April, and by September, we had over 2,500 people that have taken the quiz with a 76% completion rate. Up next, we're going to be looking at which questions seem to throw people off and using that to inform future social posts and newsletter posts. But when they click one of the answers, as you can see here with scrap metal, they get immediate feedback that, oops, and why, that material doesn't belong in there. Or when it is correct, um, when they get the answer correct, they get a very clear signal that they did get the answer right. So they know right away that they were correct on whether or not that item was recyclable. So are there ways that you could provide direct feedback to your residents? Tip five, ask for help. My husband will attest to this, but asking for help is not always my strong suit. But when it comes to your recycling education and outreach efforts, it's pretty important. You likely have your dedicated audience, those folks who will call the town, go to your website, subscribe to your newsletter, or even the select few that have your direct email or phone number as their go-to personal on-call recycling guru. But what about everyone else? Tap into the local influencers. Ask the movers and shakers in your town to help spread your message. At Recycle Smart, we have a platform or a partnership program where hundreds of municipalities, nonprofits, businesses, and community groups are helping, including many of you on this line, spread the word about smart recycling. We regularly feature our partners in our newsletter and on the website in this partner spotlight section to give kudos and thanks to the organizations going above and beyond to share the Recycle Smart message and provide inspiration for those organizations looking to do a new cool idea. Currently, we have 295 partners and we hope that all of you on this line, if you are not yet a partner, will join us. And here's the new webpage that we launched to highlight all of these partner spotlights. So far, we've spotlighted 24 partners um, in each monthly newsletter. Tip six, iterate, iterate, iterate. As someone trained in the sciences, I just couldn't not mention data. Measuring data like participation rate, annual tonnage of inbound contamination rate, are great ways to determine the effectiveness of your outreach and evaluate progress over time. Here you see how we measure the impact of Recycle Smart marketing goals based on the marketing funnel. So the idea being that we're really trying to get awareness of contamination as a problem. And then after that, obviously we're trying to encourage people to change their behavior through consideration, conversion, and loyalty. 
So here are some of the data points that we collect and look at regularly, including the number of Recyclopedia uses um, and what those top items were that people were looking at, our newsletter signups, our social media followers, our web pages, which people, which um, pages are being visited the most. Using data is relatively easy when you have digital platforms. So for example, we regularly look at the analytical reports for our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram account, as well as for the website to see what is working and what isn't. How do we use this data? We look for patterns and topics, content type, and the tone that gives us the insight to what messages are resonating well. For example, we saw that across the, all topic areas, images with a combination of text and graphics tend to receive more engagement than posts with photos only. For example, here, photos with animals are also very popular. So it, Janice, at this point, if you could launch our third and final poll. Just curious if the folks that are here today, do you use social media to share messages about recycling in your community? Okay, we have some social media lovers here with us today, which is great. And some folks that would like to learn and then folks that would like that prefer their traditional outreach methods, which is A-OK -okay as well. Um, I am personally a fan of social media because of what I just mentioned, the fact that we can learn quickly what is and what is not working. <clears throat> On the whole topic of using data to inform our messages. Here's a summary of the tagging rate improvements from the Recycling IQ Kit programs. So across all of the 31 communities who have used, um, who have implemented the Recycling IQ Kit through our grant program, tagging rates have decreased in all of these communities with an average um, decrease of 62%, which just means this is working. And if you only remember one thing today, it is to experiment and see what works and what doesn't. By looking at your data points, whatever they are, you will be able to tell what messages are resonating and inspiring residents to change their behavior, what ideas are catching on and which ones aren't. We've been playing around with a lot of different types of graphics, like this image of a text message conversation. The first draft of this graphic didn't include the reason why the necklace can't be recycled, but more and more we are seeing that our Recycle Smart audience wants to know just not just if something is recyclable or not, but why. And they're interested in the alternative solutions for harder to recycle items. Some may be willing to take back the plastic bags to the grocery store or collect and send in their wine corks. We also experiment by identifying cultural trends, like at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, more people were using delivery services, so we wanted to make sure that we shared content that was relevant and timely. Letting people know what to do with all this increased packaging, showing up at their door st um, steps from these online orders. High five or uh, elbow pump, if you prefer. This is all I have for you today. Thanks for sticking with me until the very end. And I'm sending you all these virtual high fives. I hope that you have learned a few good tips and tricks that you can take home with you and into your own recycling education journey. But before I open up for you, I have to leave you with this challenge. We know that there's a difference between knowing how to act and being motivated to act. But it, when it comes time to change the behavior of other people, our first instinct is to teach them something. How can we push past this instinct to just provide recycling information for residents and then choose instead to tap into what we know about what motivates behavior change? 
we often assume that the pattern for changing is to analyze, think, and then change, but it's not. We see, feel, and then we change. So I personally feel inspired when I think about using behavior change insights to shape our recycling education and outreach efforts. And I hope that you leave feeling today that you have a few new tools in your toolbox. So just to recap, what the tips and tricks that I'm shared with you today are get to your point fast, show, don't tell, know your audience, remove the hurdles, ask for help, and iterate, iterate, iterate. Together, we can make our recycling education and outreach efforts and take them to the next level. So at this point, I will open up for questions. Um, so I got a lot of wonderful presentations, Erin. Um, the big overall question is, are you going to be sharing your PowerPoint and can people use um, the information for their own purposes? The answer is yes. Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we will share out right. both the slides and the recording within the next couple of weeks. Okay, and please so, don't um, it, borrow it, use it however you like. <laughs> um, can someone outside of Massachusetts use it? Of course, yes. And I would say the same thing for everything that we have on RecycleSmartMA.org, that that information has always been the newsletters. We don't care if you borrow and copy and add it to your own newsletter. Um, even if you are out of state, I think that most of our messaging would be appropriate for most recycling communities. Um, for the paper statistic, it seems like there is a variation in environmental benefit statistics. Where do you go for reliable data? What was the particular paper statistic that we're talking about? Um, I don't know. Um, if Layla Hammerman would like to, can she unmute herself and ask that more specifically? Yeah, I would. That is, I mean, always something I know just from working on other projects, um, especially as we talk about extended producer responsibility, that how we measure environmental impact is important. And so there's like life cycle assessments, but I'm not quite sure I know what this question is in reference to. Okay, so sh Layla, if you want to unmute yourself, you can. I'll move on. Um, so is the one minute video you showed us uh, as a sample, I'm assuming of Rio, is is it available for use? And I'm, but I'm trying to, what I'm thinking that they're asking is, how do they get that video to use for their own purposes and other things other than just resharing? So on our resource page at RecycleSmartMA.org, there are several videos that you can feel free to download. Um, and that is why we, we put them up there was for you to be able to share and utilize however you want. I'm not 100% sure if that, I don't believe that particular image is, or that video is, um, but we'd be happy to share it. There is an email address on the website, or you can email me. I have my contact is right here, and we can try to find it for you. Uh, what data do you have regarding the impact of COVID on recycling rates? Also, many residents are asking if recycling makes really makes a difference, and if so, how much of a difference? Um, do you have pre-COVID data regarding quantifiable impact of recycling, for example, percentage of reduction in solid, solid waste tonnage for Massachusetts? So this is a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about I just start from with the beginning? Do you have uh, data regarding the impact of COVID on recycling rates? Uh, I mean, we've seen through market data some of the impacts, but we don't have it specifically at the the our organization level, I know that you, Janice, did a um, great check in with all our municipalities uh, several months ago to just see how programs were impacted. Um, but I, I would have to refer that question to someone who knows better the, the overall state of how COVID has impacted. I know that it's shift the, there's more um, shift to residential commercial or residential versus commercial because people are not at work as much. Um, and then I know there's been a big push lately to get back, especially cardboard boxes, um, because we rely on those in order to ship materials. And so I know US producers really want cardboard boxes back. 
Um, I don't know if that stems from a decrease in recycling, probably from the commercial sector, but. A decrease in um, office paper. Yes. Specifically, yes. yeah. So, you know, um, we will send out a um, an email with the links to all of the webinars that we had over the course of this week. And we had um, one on Monday that was called Why why, why do recycle? Why does recycling matter? And I think that will get to the heart of the other question that this person posed. And um, you can refer any resident who asks you that um, to that wonderful webinar that Sharon Kashida put on. So um, I'll leave it at that for that one. Yeah, um, that's great. <clears throat> how did you make the quiz? Is it online? Is it a canned program or something created in house? Yeah, so we um, were largely inspired by Recycle by City. Um, a lot of our things are inspired by other people that we see as movers and shakers in this, and I would encourage you to do similar, um, look around and see what works. The questions themselves are based off of questions we were getting over and over again on our social media channels. And then they were also based on things that were our top contaminants or top issues that we would see from our material recovery facilities about people not knowing what to do. It, on a technical end, it is a, um, I guess they call it like a widget um, embedded into our website. So we have a WordPress website and it is a specific like quiz making website. Um, yeah. I hope that answers it. <laughs> they could always share ours. Um, I don't know if you said that, but um, so the next one is, <laughs> I think this is, um, this will make you smile. What is your annual budget approximately and the number of staff working on the communication outreach campaign side? Yeah, so um, we do hire a marketing firm through a contract to help manage a lot of this, especially um, as the, platform has really grown and taken off we had just like a sh the sheer number of questions on social media has um become quite quite the job in-house at mass cp we have three staff um, people that all work on it at least part-time um and then yeah most of it is really relatively low cost because it is all a as i mentioned a digital marketing platform so we do spend some money on ads, um, but we don't have like expensive PSAs or uh, billboards, that kind of thing. Right, and and I I would also add that um, it's free to anybody who wants to use our stuff. So oh yeah yeah that's helpful for you. And then for the person who asked, and then um, for how long have you been this? intentional about it about this message trying to figure out how long the runway is before one can start to see impact um well i guess i would say that we've been intentional from the beginning obviously we're learning as we go on but the recycling iq kit which is the the predecessor like that is where we came up with recycle smart from the beginning we realized contamination was an issue a while ago 2015 had always been focused on that idea of the information hierarchy where we were trying to get at one message um, primarily because we realized that people are over overloaded with directions and instructions. And if you really want to make the biggest difference, just focus on like the top thing, at least for now. So we always recommend with that program to just um, do blitz marketing where you focus on one thing at a time. So say for the next quarter, all you do is talk about plastic bags and then the next quarter after that you can shift up your focus to say textiles that those don't belong in the recycling bin um how do you respond to comments that are false or highly negative like your commenter john who said single stream is a lie so we <laughs> we do have a entire um for social media we have a monitoring kind of I guess, what do you call that? Um, protocol, standard operating protocol for how to respond to comments that are not constructive. And sometimes we just ignore them. Sometimes we try to engage them. There are times where you're just, no matter what you say, you're not going to be able to win over or influence um, that particular 
person. They just are essentially trolling you. Um, and that's okay. There are very few instances where we would block something only if it was extremely inappropriate. Um, but yeah, we just try to come back most of the time with the data that supports that it is, you know, what is true. Um, okay, so I have another question. I'm going to wait till the end for it. Um, trees saved by recycling. Maybe that was the um, data point that they were talking about, the 15 trees saved. Oh, okay, yes. That one, I believe, was from the EPA. Um, we, we do look at the source when we are, like, we, we don't have a ton of those graphics. We do have maybe like five or six that we had developed that are more like fact-based, like the number of jobs created from recycling, um, recycling industry. And those are either based off of our own studies or um, studies that were done by someone that we believe are credible. So for that, that particular example, we would have looked towards like the EPA. Um, this one I can I can um, uh, sympathize with. It says sometimes I get stuck on how to share the recycle smart posts. It makes me feel frustrated and stupid. So sometimes it makes not post share makes me not post or share, which is really silly. But honest, I need help. Is the it a technical question of how to share or is that my platform dependent? Um, unfortunately, that. They keep switching up all of the, the rules of each platform in the game, but um, generally there is a share button. Um, but if you wanna reach out offline, I'd be happy to try to help you. I don't want you to feel frustrated with how to share our materials. We would like you to share them. <laughs> yeah, and I would actually say that if you come across a post that you really wanna share and you are having trouble, you can um, either post something on that post, like help me share this or, um, <laughs> send a, a direct message to recycle smart and uh, reference the post and we can help you uh you know right there would yeah. you say okay yeah um given your main message don't bag recycles what efforts are you making to educate shoppers and stores to not bag items when not needed I recently took a part-time job at a small local grocery store and I was so disappointed at the number of individuals that asked for a single item to be bagged yeah, that one's a hard one. Um, so we do have a lot of communities here who have passed um, bag bans in their local jurisdiction. It has um, been brought up as a statewide um, law to reduce single-use plastic bags, um, but that has been put on hold with COVID. And there has been issues with single-use being seen as more sanitary, which is something we're trying to actively um, dispel because it is not true. But anyway, um, we do message regularly about, of, like even though our main focus is really on recycling and how to recycle smart, we do often message about those upstream actions that you can take, including refusing a bag or bringing your own bag. Um, and that is encouraged in communities that charge um, a fee for single use bags or, or give a benefit for, um, using bringing their own reusable bags so that that's I'll, a hard one it's <laughs> i'll add though that we so for our first recycle palooza challenge of the month i believe we put the uh don't bag recyclables and we we capitalized refuse um mm -hmm. <laughs> i wonder if sometimes people take the bag because they just are so in habit of it um but also maybe they use it for dog waste uh, <laughs> I know that that some people do that, but I mean, that's giving a lot of benefit of the doubt. Um, so have you considered holding a workshop about using social media in recycling, education and outreach, maybe teach some principles in an app like Hootsuite? Uh, we I did have not, but we uh, did this a few years ago, but we should do it again. Yeah, we did one for Massachusetts communities a couple of years ago where we did dive into a couple of the platforms. Um, I believe we have those resources online somewhere. We could send that in as a link if we have them still. <laughs> yeah, Lori, um, Lori Sable is the one that asked if you want to send Aaron or Janice a, an email. Um, I'm 
we could probably find it but we should consider i think we talked about doing it again and i think we should do it especially since, um as we have seen firsthand these platforms do change frequently it is um an evolving thing yes exactly um next question is are you doing on-site or virtual education in schools um green teams we do have a green team program um and that is we're not doing any in classroom we give a lot of materials to teachers who sign up for the and that is um in line with recycle smart we have made sure that all of the materials the green team predates um recycle smart but we've made sure that it aligns with all of our recycle smart messages and they have um, created a really neat video um that has been shared as well through that program so um for people who don't care about environmental impact how do you do, how do you suggest making them motivated to recycle correctly yeah that's where that um i thought was very interesting the market research that we did where we realized that worker safety and municipal costs were big factors of it of um what would motivate people to not put like wish cycle or put items in the bin that don't belong there and i think that's often true you can talk about jobs that recycling creates you can talk about the economic impact or the workers that are impacted by putting in that weird metal item um or possibly like the batteries that are explosive um so i think there's many different ways to frame the message that would resonate beyond just an, an environmental message um, here's a quick one that I can answer. Are there online resources other than your own that you rely on in particular for new ideas on recycling you can adopt? I would say the Recycling Partnership. Mm-hmm. Recycling Recycle Partnership. Recycle City we yeah. like a lot too. Um, we like the other, the other, there's several other states doing similar um, initiatives like Recycle CT um, and Vermont has the Recycle Like You Live Here. Um, they have some great videos um, that mm -hmm. you can share. Those are great. Um, so you showed how all the terms for recycling send mixed messages. What term do you think is most effective in relating the fact that all of the materials accepted in a recycling program are mixed together in a single stream or in a single recycling bin? Hmm, how have we used that? I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I think we I just say recycling container, or recycling bin. Yeah, like so if I'm responding to somebody who asks a question about whether they can like say um recycle say shredded paper or something, I would say that you can't recycle shredded paper in your typical curbside re recycling program, but there are special events where you could do it. So, I just sort of break it down into like simpler terms, I guess. I don't use the jargon. I just say you can't put it in your curbside bin because mostly if they're recycling and um, they're recycling single stream. If they're doing it dual stream, then they, it's the same. It does Actually, get more complicated answer. when you talk about dual stream versus single stream. But I do, th we do, we have used that in the past too, what you're talking about, Janice, is, um, like our beyond the bin uh, directory is for things that are recyclable, but just not in your typical, I guess we would just call it, yeah, your typical recycling program that they're the harder to recycle items. Um, do you find the differences in recycling contracts by city or county, we don't really have counties, is a barrier or challenge in your outreach? Um, that is why we started with meeting with all the material recovery facilities in the state to get agreement on one list for the state. So the idea being that the sometimes there would be contracts that were different even when the material went to the exact same facility but most of the facilities really could handle and wanted the exact same things because they're dealing with the same market and it really was just we had this ground rule of you know what do you have the actual equipment to process what do you have the viable market to sell this material to and what are things that you really really don't want because they are going to harm workers or harm your equipment and that's where we got to the agreement um, where all of the MRFs in our state said yes this 
is recyclable or no, this is not, or, or acceptable, we could call it acceptable. And that is um, really was the great ground point because people were very confused when they would work in one community and live in another community and they'd have different recycle like rules of what could go in the bin and what couldn't. Um, and but that is a, that is a huge challenge in communities that have not what we call harmonized their their lists. Um, do you engage the corporation of private? I'm sorry, the cooperation of private haulers. Um, my county shoulders the burden of education, refusing to engage the private haulers who pick up the vast majority of the recycling. Yeah, I mean we have um, several haulers who have joined our partnership program many of them have adapted the smart recycling guide and put their like we've encouraged them go ahead and put your own logo on that send that out to um residents i know with your program janice um there are the most successful communities are the ones where they're doing intensive feed direct feedback in certain along certain routes of curbside pickup and then the uh haulers are also doing like kind of scattered tagging as they see issues. So the one the ones where the haulers are involved does lead to an onboard leads to a lot more success um, because you have that shared message. So we do encourage and we regularly reach out to our haulers and our MRFs to make sure we're all singing from the same sheet of music that we or we reached out at the beginning when we started talking about pizza boxes um, to make sure that everyone knew that was coming so that they could align their own educational materials to sync up with what we were saying. And, you know, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing discussion. So we have about four more minutes. So I'm going to try to see if we can power through a few more questions. Um, this is a good one. When you remove items from a recycling program, how do you put this information out? Our, lo our locality is unwilling to promote removal of items because I think it makes the program look unsuccessful? So I think that where we've really stood on this, we have not had to remove, since the beginning of this launch, um, we haven't removed any materials from the program. But I would say that really stressing that you want people to trust that what they put into the bin is actually getting recycled because the worst thing is when you put something in the bin or you're encouraged to but then you know that it's just going to residue and think about how you are paying for that twice you're paying for that in terms of the greenhouse gases of going to the facility the labor of being sorted at the facility and then it just ends up in a residue pile and then that residue pile is then has like has to go to a landfill or an incinerator so if you think about it in that way by not being completely transparent and honest about what materials have an actual market and have an actual ability to be sorted you're doing yourself a disservice because you're it's it's just signaling um, you just people need to start accepting that not every item can be recyclable, even if we want it to. Um, ah, sorry. So Veronique uh, wanted to chime in that um, COVID uh, rates changing. Recycling residential residential recycling was increased by six to twelve percent. To just answer the question from earlier. Oh, thank you for finding um, that. I'm working with Mass General on something to reduce waste and was inspired by their waste manager who visited the recycling plant to better understand the problem. It mm -hmm. moved him to take more action. I'm a big believer in using data to make change, but you made a great point about making an emotional connection to get a message across. Obviously, we can't send everyone to a recycling plant, but is there another method you would recommend to make that emotional connection? And I would say we have a Vimeo on our website. Isn't that right? Um, we yeah so we have on our website the ability for you to map and find out which like well at least if you're a Massachusetts resident find out exactly which material recovery facility your material goes to which is like part of it and the longer term vision is that we want to be able to show um, we do have a couple of videos that show inside of a material recovery facility and show the workers and there's interviews with workers explaining you know what items shouldn't go in there um, and then we are working on like a, a larger schematic or idea of um, why it matters and explaining what happens at a MRF um, because that's great. I mean, 
that's the most enlightening thing is when you can actually see it hands-on. And that's why in that newsletter, we did talk about what a day in the life looks at like at a material recovery facility. In fact, the um, person that we featured on that, he showed the article to his wife and she learned something new about his job just by reading that because, you know, not our spouses don't always know what we do. But um, <laughs> I thought that was, it, it's great to be able to show that um, in a very concrete way. So video is a great way to do that. So we're at noon, um, but we still have a lot of people online. So, I mean, if we want to power through these last few questions, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And if people want to stay on, they can. Um, does Massachusetts have, or are you working toward a standard list of recyclables? If not, have you gotten pushback from your state level list of recyclables? Um, we do have a standard list of recyclables. That's the Recyclopedia, anything that you, and, and the Smart Recycling Guide. So um, yes, we have gotten some pushback from some of the um, towns that have contracts with different lists, but we do encourage them to sync up with our list. I think that's a... Yep, you answered that you, Okay, do you provide resources to students as well? I'm guessing this is also green teams. Okay, so um, I think that was answered already. Uh, oh, here's especially, it's, so this person's looking for, um, information for large group of people like hospital workers or universities mm -hmm. yeah we've Do had many universities um and hospitals adopt the smart recycling materials the and i didn't i failed to mention which i don't know how um the smart recycling guide is available in eight different languages now um and all of our material we do have available the um by, like the Adobe Illustrator files, so people can tweak and modify to make them work for their own. Like if you want to put your logo on it, cool. <laughs> um, okay. Here's somebody. Um, it says, "I'm from Michigan." Yay! A fellow Yay, Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> um, glass from has been right here, <laughs> <laughs> and glass has been eliminated from many local recycling programs. 10 years ago, we would have advised people to opt for purchasing food in glass jars rather than plastic, since glass would always be recyclable. Now the glass is not being collected. Should we be encouraging people to buy in, in plastic containers? That's a really complicated one. So if you look at the, um, the LCA, the life cycle assessments, um, because glass weighs more, it actually does have a larger environmental impact and the market's are struggling i mean here we still do collect glass we've done a lot of um, investment in developing a new market if it's not going to turn into another bottle like we're going to have um, it turned into process glass aggregate and we're looking for other markets the plus process glass aggregate can be used in like municipal land or like road construction projects and that kind of thing but i guess that's been an issue when we encourage people to switch to from one item or one material to the next item based off of the recyclability. It's not always the best indicator or as an attribute if you're just talking about the environmental impact. So um, if you are really just trying to get people to have something that is recyclable, then yeah, you would wanna push, I guess, to containers that are recyclable in your system. Um, and I guess the one advantage also of maybe the alternatives is they might also be lighter and lighter packages tend to have less of a transportation um, impact as well. So, so I, that's a hard one, I mean, with it, but you have the bottle bill in Massachusetts or in Michigan. So all those uh, alcoholic bottles, at least they can, the, those glass mm -hmm. ones, um, those are great. So can go so into the return. Question. Um, doesn't glass really cause contamination problem, especially with paper? I'm guessing, um, you know, in terms of asking people to use something other than glass, is there an argument for not using glass? I mean, I think you kind of just covered it, but. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could argue both ways. It's, it's a very complicated topic, but um, it, it is. It's one of the ones we held a line with our material recovery facilities and said, you, you got to keep glass in the, the program. But we were able to kind of strong arm that a little bit because we have a material um, ban waistband. on a waistband on that material. Um, but I do know that 
there is a market issue right now, unfortunately, with glass. And like I just said, there is um, some attributes of glass are a little bit less ideal. How could an industry trade association help or echo your message? We know consumers are going to look locally, but if we too have recycling education, what would you recommend? Yeah, joining as a partner and um, sharing all the resources. Uh, they're all, you, <laughs> you're able to use anything that we, we have available. So yep. we'd encourage that. I think that's great to have um, that message be amplified by as many different people and in many different ways as possible. Um, so this one says uh, a workshop on using social media for recycling outreach would be great. Um, that is from somebody who actually participated in the last one. So <laughs> Marissa <laughs> will be asking you. Um, follow up to bad question. Are you aware of any national efforts to get large retailers to ask consumers if they want it bagged? Um, I can't remember 100% sure, but the break free from plastic legislation, the national legislation, it does include um, several ban items as well as uh, extended producer responsibility um, component. That's the only one I know of that might include, I, I can't remember off the top of my head if it includes bags as one of the items that are not um, allowed. Um. So you talked about getting residents' attention visually to share specific recycling messages. Have you considered how to reach residents who are blind and visually impaired and provide guidance to them on how to recycle? That is a really great question. On our own social media platforms, we haven't. Um, most of our focus has been more on making sure that things are accessible in multiple languages. Um, I know our agency does do a good job with that in terms of having everything. Um, we do have a coordinator that's able to translate or help um, anyone who is blind. Uh, that's a good question and we'll have to take that into more consideration. Agreed. I think we it's, it's an ongoing um, challenge to be as inclusive as we can. Um, I think that's it. The other ones were mostly comments about how great we are. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, um, and here's an observation from um, a post Recycling IQ kit grantee. She said, we have a few residents who are convinced that neighboring towns still accept items like cartons or styrofoam and even mm -hmm. go so far as to bring them to friends in other towns to recycle. The new Where Does It Go tool has been a huge help to combat this myth, so thank you for creating it. <laughs> I am glad that, I, that I've never even thought about that as a, um, a utilization for that that tool, but yes, it does. It makes sense because it's all going to that same, especially with it, their neighboring towns, it's most likely I've going to the same material. Of, uh, I've never heard of illegal dumping for cartons and styrofoam, but you know, <laughs> it's very granular the more questions you ask. <laughs> Um, I think we're good. Okay, well, thank you everyone so much for joining and thank you Janice for doing an amazing job uh, facilitating all of those questions and we will be in touch with the um, recording and the slides uh, in a week or so and um, enjoy the rest of your, your days.